Please remain standing, and if you have your Bible in your hand, I would like to direct your attention this morning to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 to 6. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 to 6. Hear the holy and infallible word of God from the Apostle Peter. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past, suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. That though judged in the flesh, the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we remember the time that you have sent the manna, the heavenly manna upon your people Israel when they were in the wilderness. And by that you reminded them that you are the one who always gives to your people the bread of life. And Jesus is the bread of life. And this morning we ask you to do the same thing. For us, your people here at Redeemer, worshiping you, calling upon your name with every element of our worship, we ask you to feed us by Christ, the eternal word and the bread of life. Give your people ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to believe and obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Time is something that we are aware of and count. We do have a little device on our rest that helps us to be on time, to start things in time and finish on time. We count by seconds and minutes and days and months, and out of them we make even a year. We all are conscious of time. We are time conscious people. How many of you know that what the average life expectancy of people in the U.S. is? I don't mean to frighten you, but it is 79. The average life expectancy in the U.S. is 79 years which tells you that we don't have much time here on earth. We don't have much time here on earth to do the things that we want to do with our life, but also the things that we do, we need to do with the kingdom of God, with evangelizing the world, with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a very limited time here on earth to accomplish all those things in 
our Christian life. And I bring this idea of the importance and the value of time in the Christian life. Because Peter here in our text this morning, he's addressing the believers about the urgency of time. The urgency of time that God has given them in their Christian life. At the time that they were suffering for the cause of the gospel. If you notice in our text carefully, he talks about the time that them and we leave it before our conversion. He also talked about the time that we are living in now as believers. The time that we are living in as believers, anticipating or expecting to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ back to us. Three period, period of, periods of time, the two are together. The time before our conversion, the time that we are living as believers, but the time that we are living as we uh, expect the return of Christ back to the world to judge the dead and the living. Those are the times that Peter is dealing with this morning in our text. And as he deals with, with those specific periods of times, Peter is reminding us that we as believers, with the limited time that we have here on earth, we should have this sense of urgency deep in our hearts to be ready to suffer for the cause of righteousness. My dear friends, time is a gift from God. But time is a very difficult, very elusive gift from God. Unless we use our time carefully and wisely in our Christian life, we can waste, waste et eternity. We can endure eternity in our own life and in the life of other people around us. Remember what the psalmist prayed in Psalm 90, verse 12. The psalmist prayed saying, So, teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. His prayer to God was to teach him and to teach the people of Israel, and this morning to teach everyone here at Redeemer, in our worship service, to count, to number his days. Which means to invest his time to things that are related to eternity. To the suffering of the people of God for the cause of righteousness. And to do the will of God. Not just to spend our time, but to invest our time for the things related to eternity. And how do we do that? We do that by having a sense of urgency to do the will of God. But you should ask, how? How do we do that? Peter provides to us three ways by which or through which we can be prepared, we can be ready. We, we can have a, a sense of urgency to suffer for the cause of Christ as we do the will of God. And three, these three ways from our text are this. Number one, resisting sin. Number two, longing to do the will of God. And number three, evangelizing the lost. By resisting the sin in your life, by having longing or a desire to do the will of God, and by having a desire to evangelize the lost, you use your time to live for the glory of the Son of God. 
So let me start with the first one, resisting sin. Notice verse 1, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So now the first thing that Peter does is, he still brings to you the suffering Messiah. He still is reminding you that Christ suffered in the flesh. His suffering was real. His pain was real. If you are suffering today, in any form, in any way, Christ understands your suffering and your pain because his suffering was in the flesh. But Christ suffered for the ultimate cause. The reason why Christ suffered in the flesh was to deliver you and me from the power of sin, from the bondage of sin. He suffered in the flesh to bring us to the presence of his heavenly Father, to reconcile us with God the Father. He suffered in the flesh, but for ultimate cause. In Romans 4.25, Paul said, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. You see, my friends, Christ suffered in the flesh for your justification. But you are suffering in the flesh for the cause of righteousness. You see, Peter is saying, if you are suffering today as a believer for the cause of righteousness, your suffering is not a sign of your separation from God. Your suffering is not an evidence that God is not happy with you. If you are really suffering for the name of Christ, for the cause of righteousness, your suffering is the sign of your maturity. Your suffering is the evidence that the Holy Spirit is at work in you to sanctify you. To change you, to transform you to the image of the Son of God. That's why you are suffering in the flesh. That was the will of the Father, you see, for the Son to suffer for the cause of justification of the children of God. It always amazes me Christ's attitude towards suffering. Listen to Luke in Luke 9.51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up to Jerusalem, he set his face to Jerusalem. That was Christ's attitude to suffering. You remember the devil came to him in the wilderness and he tempted him with power, with riches, and with food. And Jesus said, no, I'm not going to give up to these things. I have a purpose. I'm going to suffer until I arrive to Jerusalem to be crucified for, just, for the justification of the people of God. He set his face towards Jerusalem. That was the attitude of Christ to suffer because of what? Because of your sin. Every time you think about the cross, every time you look to the cross by faith, my brother and my sister in Christ, you should always remind yourself, this is because of me. He's suffering in the flesh because of my sin. But your suffering is not for justification. Your suffering is for righteousness sake. And Peter is reminding you, exhorting you to have the same thinking, the same attitude that Christ had towards suffering, towards your own suffering. You see, Peter turns his attention to you and he says this, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. 
Same attitude that Christ had towards suffering. Arm yourself with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, some of you might think, oh, okay. So if I suffer in the flesh, it means I, I will be perfect. It means I will be without sin. I will be sinless. No, that's not what Peter is saying. We, know, we, we all know that, you know, if you have, uh, if you have surgery for cancer, or, or you are, if you are going through medical treatment, if you are suffering physically, you are not sinless. Or you will not be sinless. He's talking about suffering for the cause of righteousness, and he's telling you, when you suffer for the cause of righteousness, your focus will be on doing the will of God, not do, uh, doing the will of the flesh. So you will not think about committing sin, but you will think about glorifying God in your life. You will not have time to entertain any kind of sin in your life because you are suffering for the cause of righteousness and what you are doing will take you away from sin. You will say enough to sin. You will... You will Follow the example of Christ. You will have the same attitude towards sin. Same attitude that Christ has. You see, this is a military word. Arm yourselves. He's repeating it. He said the same thing in, in, uh, in verse 13, chapter 1. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is a military word, and he's telling you, be ready to suffer for the cause of righteousness. Like a soldier, be prepared, be ready to engage in battle against sin so that you would suffer well for the cause of righteousness. Ephesians 6.10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Be ready and take up the whole armor of God to do what? To resist sin in your life. To resist sin in your life is to do the will of God. And to do that, you need, you need to have Christ's attitude towards uh, suffering. My friends, Paul in Romans 6 reminds us this as believers in verse 12 and 13. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. There was a writer by the name Henry David who once said, you, you, can, you can't kill time without enduring eternity. You know, sometimes you take a, an appointment with a friend and you arrive to the place of your appointment early. And a friend who is passing by see you and he comes to you and he asks you, what, what are you doing? And the normal response that people give is, I'm killing time. If Peter would hear you saying that to your friend, Peter would say, don't kill time, invest your time. Instead, you kill your time until your time of appointment is up. Why don't you go to that person and tell him about Jesus? Why do you kill your time? You don't have time. Invest your time for something related to eternity. Don't kill time. Sometimes we even think our time of vacation is, you know time that we uh, kill time? No. If that was the case, we could have called our vacation killing time. 
It's a time of refreshment. It's a time where we spend our time with our wife and with our children. It's a time that we commune with God, read His Word, and reflect on our spiritual walk. We don't kill time as Christians. We invest our time for eternity. And for that, you see, Peter is saying, use the members of your body to resist sin. Remember what the Lord told Cain in Genesis 4, 7. The Lord said, Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Accepted, and if you do not, if you do, not do well, sin, said the Lord, crouching at the door. And its desire is for you, the Lord said, but you must rule over it. Cain, sin is crouching at the door of your heart. And this is what I want you to do. Rule over it. Resist sin. If you want to be accepted, James 4, 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now you might say, Pastor, but that's hard. That's hard. How, how can I fight the devil so that the devil would flee away from me? How do I do that? I'm weak. My prayer life is not strong. My reading life is not strong. My worship life is, is not strong. I'm, I'm a weak Christian. How, how, how can I do that? Remember what, what Jesus told his disciples, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Watch and pray. If you do that, the Holy Spirit will help you. God, the Spirit will help you to resist temptation in your life. So suffering, you see, suffering for believers is an advantage. For believers to resist sin, for believers to stay away from sin, if you will, because your focus will be on doing the will of God. And secondly, longing to do the will of God. Listen, verse 2. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human, human passions, but for the will of God. Not to do the things that you were doing in your former life before your conversion, but to do the will of God. But what is the will of God for me? What is the will of God for you, the people of God? How do you know what the will of God for you is? You see, Peter is basically telling us through the message this morning to do the will of God. Using or investing our time in doing the will of God. But how do you do that? How do you know what the will of God for you is? You know, you are familiar with some of the ways that people try to discover the will of God for their life. Yes? Or well, some people, they go to, to the corner of a room and they do humming and they're silent. Uh, some people, they, they, they call it uh, uh, yoga exercise. It's very mystical, so that the deity would whisper uh, at, in your ears and, and tell you what the will of God is for you. Is that how we know what the will of God for us is? And when I was very young, you know, we, we tried, uh, you know, uh, flipping the coin to do the will of God. Oh, that's the will of God for me. That, that was what my, my mind was thinking. And I flipped the coin and I said, oh, that's the will of... When I was young, I tried that many times and it took me no, no, nowhere. What about putting your finger on the verse in the Bible randomly? And then you open your eyes and that's the will of God for you. Don't do that because there is a verse in the Bible that says, and Judas went out and hung up himself. That's not the way you know what the will of God for you is. You come to the Word of God. You come to the Bible. You come to the Scripture to know what the will of God for you is. 
And the will of God for you is this, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. And God uses suffering for the cause of righteousness to sanctify your Christian life. And the will of God, Paul said, for you is your sanctification. The will of God for you is to believe in Christ, the Son of God, whom the Father sent to save you from sin. The will of God for you, according to Paul and Peter, is to love the saints. Even when you are treated unjustly. But to love all people in the name of Christ and for the cause of the gospel. That's the will of God for you. And that's what Peter is saying. And when, when you do the will of God in this way, then you will renounce your former life. You will renounce idolatry, sens sensuality, and drunkenness. And all those sins of the flesh that the represents the world and the desire of the flesh, you will renounce them. You will condemn that lifestyle and you will invest your time in doing the will of God. The former was doing the desires of the flesh. It was slavery to sin. But now, the life that you have now is for the glory of the Son of God. Now, I had many, many Christians coming to me. When it comes to resisting sin, renouncing the former life and do the will of God, many, many people have come to me in the past saying to me, Pastor, I, I get it. I get it. I understand. That's my duty. But it's hard. Some Christians, they ask, isn't the law of God hard? It is difficult. I think about the Ten Commandments. They're hard. It's a heavy load. Pastor, how can I do that as a Christian? How can I renounce the desires of the flesh and invest my time in doing the will of God? It's hard. My friend, it's not hard. Who said that? Jesus said that in Matthew 11. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And in 1 John 5, John, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he said, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. That's the Bible. It's the word of God. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's a matter of who you love. Do you love yourself? Do you love the world? Do you love the flesh or do you love God? That's the issue. If you love God, his commandments are easy. Jesus kept them for you perfectly. So that you would join him by faith. And have his life and perfection. Paul said, the life that I have now is not the life of Paul. It's the life of Christ in me. It is not Paul who lives now. But Christ in me, Paul said, lives in me. Christ, the Son of God, his righteousness, his perfection is in me. If I love God, his commandments are not burdensome. And then thirdly and lastly. Evangelizing the lost. Listen to verse 6. Verse 6. Where Peter said, For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Now, you should start from verse for to understand what Peter is saying. Peter said, with respect to this, the, the things of the flesh that he mentioned, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. 
but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Now, this is what Peter is saying. For you as a believer, you don't have much time. For you as a believer, you have a very limited time to invest your time for eternity. But in the same way, for the unbelievers around you, family members, friends, co-workers, unbelievers around you, they also have a very limited of time to hear about the gospel. And people who should tell them about the gospel are you, the people of God. You have limited time, they have limited time, and they will give account to the one who will judge them if they go to hell without hearing the message of the gospel. God will hold you accountable for that. Because Peter said, for this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, spiritually dead people. Not those who are dead now, they had their time, so we are not able to preach the gospel to them. They are dead, they are not alive. But those who are spiritually dead but physically alive, they are everywhere around us, and it is our duty to go to them and preach the gospel to every one of them. Isn't where, you know, all the time... You know, you, you think about your family members. You think about your uncle, your cousin, your niece. And you come to preachers, you know, in time like this, and you say, Pastor, you don't know these people. You don't live with them. I live with them. I know them. They're very aggressive. They're very unfriendly. They don't want to hear anything about the gospel. You don't know them. I know them. I live with them. And my answer to all of you would be, yes, yes, I, I don't know them the same way you know them. But I know something about them. How do I know? The Bible tells me something about them. And what the Bible tells me about them is this, they are blind. The ruler of this world has blinded their mind and their hearts. They are blind. Listen to Paul in 2 Corinthians 4. In their case... In the case of unbelievers, your friends, your family members, co-workers, in, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. You see, that is the reason why they are not friendly towards what you tell them. They are blind. I remember one time I was visiting a friend in Washington, D.C., and my friend took me to the train station to visit another friend. And as we were crossing the road to go, to, to go inside to the train station, I saw this blind man trying to cross the road. And he was struggling, and one car almost ran over him. And I was concerned, and I was about to make a move to go to him and help him. And my friend who lived in America for many years, he told me, what are you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm going to help him. And he said, no, some of them, they don't, they, don't, they don't want people to help them. So you have to be very careful with what you do on the street here in America. I said, really? And, and I saw another woman coming to the blind man, and he touched him. And the blind man said, Leave me alone. I don't, I don't need your help. Isn't what the unbelievers sometimes say to you? I don't need your help. Do you know why? They're blind. They don't see what you see. They haven't experienced what you have experienced in Christ Jesus. They're blind. They need help. And the means, you see, God uses to go to them and show them the light is you. That's what Peter is saying here. That's why we need to preach the gospel to those who are spiritually dead. It's you, my friends. That's the reason why we are in Clarkston. 
That's the reason why we always, we always encourage you to volunteer even half an hour in Clarkistan to talk to a Muslim, to talk to someone from another nation or unbeliever from anywhere and tell him about Jesus. Who would do that apart from us who have known and experienced the love of Jesus? No one else except us. How do you invest your time for eternity? By resisting sin, by having a sense of urgency to proclaim the gospel, and by evangelizing the lost. And you might say, how do I accomplish these things in my life? Let me ask you this so that you would apply these things in your Christian life today. Let me ask you this. How are you investing your time today? You might say, well, you know, Pastor, I work. I have a full-time job. I work. I'm a student. I, I'm, I'm in college. I, I study. That's how I invest my time. I invest my time in the ministry of the church. I invest my time in my school. I invest my time for my family. Good. That's the will of God for you. You are not doing something that is contrary to the will of God. But my question to you is, are you doing all these things for the glory of God? Do you love your children for the glory of God? Do you love one another as wife and husband for the glory of God? Are you working? Are you going to work every day for the glory of God? If you are doing that, you are investing your time for eternity. Are you resisting sin in your life? When you are at work, in school, wherever you are, do you resist sin all the time in your life? In Proverbs 1, you know, we, our brother read Proverbs 1 for us. And in Proverbs 1, you see wisdom. Christ himself calls you to learn from him how to live your Christian life. Are you doing the will of God? And the word of God and the sacrament, my friends, is your means of grace to accomplish all these things in your life. You see, that's why Pastor Chris in the morning was encouraging you to come back and partake the Lord's Supper this evening. That's your food. That's your strength. It's not only a command, but it is also your food, your spiritual food, to do these things in your Christian life by the grace of God. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, once again, we give thanks to you for the gift of your word, for the proclamation of the gospel to each and every one of us, and help us to, to store and to take all these things deep in our heart, to change our perception of things, especially the limited time that we have here on earth, to suffer for the cause of righteousness, to be ready to join Christ in his suffering, to evangelize the lost. Oh Lord, enable your people today after hearing a word, after them hearing you to exhort them by your word, by your spirit. Help each and every one of them to respond to the preaching of the word of God that they have heard from the pulpit today to joyfully and willingly apply these things in their Christian life, especially in investing their time for matters of eternity. Oh Lord, fill Redeemer as a church with men and women and children who always have a sense of urgency to proclaim the good news of the gospel to the lost. In Jesus' name we pray.